Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's Tuesday, August 15th, 2023. We got a special type of show for you today. We're going to talk about the Magnificent Seven. If you haven't heard of the Mag Seven, uh, you're about to. And uh, I'm sure you've heard of the seven companies that make up this group. And they're the big names. And they have been the leaders. They have been the stocks driving the market to one of its best first six months ever. We're going to dive into these names, the Apples, the Amazons, the men of the, of the world. And from there, where do they go next? That's the big question. All that more coming up right now on Making Money. Over 1 million people around the world follow Wall Street veteran Mark Chaikin for his shockingly accurate stock market predictions. He just gave them a dire warning. Mark says, We're about to witness an historic stock market shakeup that can soon create devastating losses for investors who don't know what's coming. And as a result, you only have 90 days to move your money. You see, Mark spent 50 years on Wall Street at some of the most prestigious hedge funds in history. And he's been on Fox Business and CNBC countless times. But this is a financial story no one else is telling. And if you let this take you by surprise, you could be in for a world of pain. He explains everything and a brand new free report available at rollingcrash2023.com. He includes a name and ticker of a popular stock that could be directly impacted by what's happening as well. Mark warned of the beloved pet brand Chewy before it fell 45%. Tech company C Limited before it fell 66%. Furniture company Wayfair before it fell 76%. Social media favorite Snap before it fell 36%. And food delivery company DoorDash before it fell 65%. Mark even called the Amazon crash before the FANG stock fell 35%. So you want to avoid the stock in this new report immediately. Again, simply go to rollingcrash2023.com for your free copy of this new report. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me here. It is the 15th of August, 2023. It is a beautiful Tuesday afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. We're going to jump into uh, a bit of a different show here today. Um, we're going to talk about the Magnificent Seven. As I mentioned in the open, if you have not heard of uh, the Mag Seven, as we'll call it for short, uh, we'll we'll detail that for you throughout the show. Uh, we'll let you know what this means for your portfolio. If you're in the stock market, I can almost guarantee that you have some exposure, if not exposure to all the seven stocks that make up the Magnificent Seven. So let's name them right now. Apple, of course, the largest publicly traded company in the world right now. Uh, We have Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, used to be known as Google, uh, Amazon, NVIDIA, which has been the darling this year of the uh, the face of the artificial intelligence boom, uh, Tesla, and then Meta, which used to be Facebook. Those are the mag seven, and they have made up majority of the gains of both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 this year. To the tune of, for the first half of the year, the first six months of the year, the MAG-7 accounted for 73% of all the gains in the S&P 500. Let that sink in. The S&P 500, as it sounds, is made up of 500 companies, but just seven of them accounted for 73% of the gains in the first six months of the year, one of the best first six months we've ever seen uh, in the stock market. That means the other 493, 493 only accounted for 27%. It's hard to even fathom that when you think about it, uh, because how it's so concentrated on just so few stocks. But we'll talk about why that happened in a moment. We're going to talk about where they stand today. And more importantly, my view on the Magnificent Seven, that's why I say Mag Seven. It's a tough word for me to say. We'll talk about the MAG-7, where they're going from here, looking out to the future. So first off, why did they lead? Why did they make up 73% um, of this gain that we saw in the first uh, six months of the year? Well, I think it's very simple, and it's uh, two letters, and that's AI, uh, very short for artificial intelligence. Uh, We've talked about it in the show many times. I'm sure you've read about it. I've heard you you probably, every time you turn TV, people are talking about it your friends, your family, your coworkers, it's truly everywhere. 
which I find a bit amusing because if you follow me for any amount of time, uh, for several years now, uh, maybe even more than five years, I've been describing artificial intelligence uh, in many different ways. But one way that I always uh, describe artificial intelligence is that it's a technology that is everywhere, but nowhere. And what I mean by that is artificial intelligence didn't just pop onto the scene late last year when ChatGPT became the fastest uh, app to have 1 million downloads. It's that what that wasn't when AI just popped out. Artificial intelligence has really been around for decades. Not to the extent of what it is now, uh, not to the level of what it is now, granted. That being said, Google to me, and again, I've been saying this for many years, Google to me has been an artificial intelligence company. Not necessarily a search company, but artificial intelligence. The reason that their search, when you type in one letter and it fills it in with exactly what you're thinking, is so good and it seems to get better every darn day to a point where it's almost scary. The reason it's so good at doing that is artificial intelligence. It's learning every time you use your Google search. It's taking everybody else's uh, Google searches and then running this through supercomputers using artificial intelligence to help predict the future. And in this case, predict what you're looking for. And then from there, serving you uh, the links or the ads, depending on, on what you're looking at, that should fit what you're looking for as well. And again, I mean, probably tough to notice if you use Google every day like me. But if you think about using Google search five, 10 years ago, it's gotten much better. And again, some people will say that's scary because it's too good. It's almost sometimes, I mean, I, I, we've all have stories of this where you say something out loud or you're even just thinking it and you start typing it in. It's like, holy crap. How do they know I won the search what the members of the Philadelphia Phillies 1980 World Series team was? I don't know. Like, because I just happy watching the Phillies. Maybe my computer's watching me watch the Phillies. Maybe they hear me watching the Phillies. I don't know, but it's pretty amazing when I type in one nine and that fills it. And again, we all have stories like this, but that's why it's leading. These seven companies, we'll talk about them each individually in a moment. These seven companies all have major ties to artificial intelligence and all are leaders in respective categories when it comes to artificial intelligence. You know, big tech alone uh, was beaten down during a little bit during 2022 uh, before really taking off here in 2023. But prior to that, let's go back a couple of years uh, to um, uh, the, the COVID shutdown, the pandemic, when the world basically seized, you know, it basically shut down. Uh, nobody's going to work. Couldn't go to restaurants. You couldn't go to the gym. Heck, you were shamed for going outside without a mask on. I mean, it was, the world was upside down. And that forced people to work from home uh, and forced people to still continue to be productive in, in a lot of um, different industries, but again, from home. So tech had to take a big leap forward to be able to allow that to happen because you didn't have your super fast internet at your office. You're now in your house, your apartment, your condo, or you're traveling in your RV. Who the hell knows where you were? And you suddenly needed to have better connection, better technology. So that was a huge boost for tech uh, in general, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, they came out of it stronger than ever. And uh, again, NVIDIA, the big leader this year when it comes to AI and chips uh, and CPUs, or sorry, GPUs. Uh, NVIDIA, their chips were in huge demand uh, during that time. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, cryptocurrency mining going on at the time. Big demand for uh, their, their uh, GPUs there as well. So all this kind of together led to the perfect storm for tech to have this amazing rally uh, through the first six months of the year and even into uh, the third quarter of the year. You know, believe it or not, at one point here in the last few weeks, uh, the valuation of the MAG-7 hit $11 trillion. $11 trillion. That's triple the size of Germany's entire stock market. Germany is the largest economy in Europe, one of the largest economies in the world, and the top seven stocks here that I'm talking about, the MAG7, were worth three times what the entire stock market of Germany was worth. Unbelievable. Again, you say it out loud and it's tough to really understand it, uh, at least from my perspective, just how big and how, how, how far they've gone. 
So before we dive into companies, let's take a look at a couple of charts here that I found interesting. I got for you. Um, first, we're going to take a look here uh, at the 20 largest S&P 500 companies today. And here you can see them. And the mag seven are seven in the top eight. And the only reason it changed is just uh, a day or two ago, Berkshire Hathaway became number seven, overtaking Tesla. But as you can see, Apple, 2.79 trillion. Uh, Microsoft, 2.45 trillion. Alphabet, 1.6. And uh, Amazon, 1.4. Nvidia, 1.1. So we now have five companies worth over a trillion dollars, two over two trillion. Uh, Apple hit the three trillion uh, before the pullback that it had uh, in the, just in the last month. Um, Tesla at one point was a one trillion dollar company as well. And what's amazing, I remember Tesla, or sorry, Apple becoming a trillion dollar company not too long ago. People saying, oh my God, it hit a trillion. It can't go any bigger. It can't get any bigger than this. A few years later, it's three trillion. It triples from there. So it's, it's, uh, it's doable. But you look at this and, um, you're seeing this and, and there's also some red and green on the screen. The red means that they were not in the top 20 10 years ago. So, uh, you can take a look there. It's what, three, six. So half of them were not in there. Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, Facebook weren't in the top 10. Uh, sorry, top 20, 10 years ago. Tesla, Visa, United Health weren't. Eli Lilly, which has been on a darn tear. It's worth much more than that because it rallied after I put this chart together. Uh, uh, MasterCard, Broadcom, and Home Depot. Uh, they were not in the top 20, 10 years ago. I'm going to show you another chart now. We're going to go back. Uh, this was the uh, 20 largest S&P stocks 10 years ago. Um, so it's kind of taking what I just talked about. And it shows the market cap back then versus today. Again, 10 years ago, I guarantee, I, I, I may have said this, but I guarantee most people out there were saying, Apple's worth $422 billion. Are you crazy? That's so expensive. As I told you, it hit $3 trillion recently. So that's what, seven and a half times in 10 years? That's amazing. You can see the change there, you know, from just, and that's at the two, the 2.789 trillion. Look at the change. The change in value is $2.36 trillion in value added. But I, I thought this was interesting because you can see how much Apple's gained, how much Microsoft's gained. That being said, you look at ExxonMobil was in the top 20. Uh, and it actually uh, has fallen the other way. Or sorry, it, it did gain $21 billion. Not that that's a spare change, but it gained $21 billion. A couple of losses. GE's lost $123 billion. Wells Fargo down $65 billion. IBM, AT&T, Citigroup all down. Philip Morris barely up. So really outside of Apple, Google, Microsoft, none of the other uh, MAG7s are in here. But those three, obviously, you see how much they gained much more than everything else combined there uh, by, by several, several um, fold. I mean, just so much more. I wanted to show you that, just give you an idea of where we were 10, 10 years ago, uh, where we are today. Now let's take a look at a chart here. This is the uh, year-to-date performance. Uh, this was as of last week when I put this together. Year-to-date performance of the MAG-7. The, it also has the S&P 500 on here. So... At the time, the S&P 500 is the lowest one on this chart, up 18.8%. The worst performer of the MAG-7 happens to be the largest, Apple, up a paltry 38%. And then we have Microsoft, which is the second largest, right there with Microsoft, up 38.3%. Then on the other side, NVIDIA, more than tripled its share price, up 210%. Meta. Meta, Facebook. I will admit I own this for my own personal account for a while, and uh, I just sold it last week uh, uh, right near the high. I got lucky. I wrote a cover call and got called out, and I'm glad I did because I think there's a pullback coming. But Meta up 163%, and even Tesla with the pullback as of late, still more than a double, up 104%. So, folks, you don't see gains like this every day. Uh, this is not normal. Um, so I want you to know we are really in unprecedented times. So what it comes down to now is where do we go from here? That's a song, right? It's, it's ringing a song in my head, and I'm not going to sing it because I'm a terrible voice, but uh, I'm just ringing a, a song in my head. But where do we go from here? I think the MAG-7 will underperform the other 493 stocks of the S&P 500 
in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, I, I think they will underperform. Let me caveat though that with, and you know, I'm hedging myself here. It doesn't mean I would go out and sell the Mag 7 if I had them, or even worse, short the Mag 7. All I'm saying is, I think the rest of the market will catch up to the big guys. So let's take a look at these stocks. And, and we'll start with the big guy. And we'll start with Apple. Um, take a look at Apple. And you know, here's a chart of Apple. And it had earnings and it fell on that. Uh, it's now down to the lowest level uh, that it's been in about two months, give or take. And uh, it's fallen from like $200 a share to about $170 or so. So it's fallen about 20%. And I, I see great support between 170, 175 here. I see the 200 day moving average, which is the blue line at 160. So could it pull back to 160 to 170? Yes. And if it does, is it a great buy there? Probably yes. At this point, I wouldn't touch it because usually when you gap down like that, a lot of times you have to let that shake out, that post earnings sell off, uh, the malaise that's hanging over the stock right now. People start bashing it. Uh, that creates this, uh, you know, yell fire for the exits and everybody runs out. So, yeah, I mean, I, I still love Apple long term. Uh, the one thing I will say with Apple is it's only expected to grow the next couple of years, revenue and earnings, both between about six to six and a half percent on both the top line and bottom line. So that huge double digit growth and even the low double digit growth uh, is probably gone for Apple at this point until a new product or new breakthrough comes through. And I wouldn't put anything past Tim Cook and his team there to come up with something new. So, um with Apple, it's kind of like a wait and see, uh, but the pullback here has already created potentially a buying opportunity at some point uh, in the near future, I believe, for Apple. Again, even though I told you earlier, I think the 493 outperform a seven, it doesn't mean these seven are dead. Microsoft's very similar. Uh, it hit about $365 a share. We're down to 324. So we're down about 12% or so. Uh, it's now below the 50-day moving average. But I see, again, a lot of price support around a $300 level. It's a psychological level as well. At that point, when it pulls back there, that blue line will likely come up. That's a 200-day moving average. You know, so it could see a little bit more. So again, very similar situation with Microsoft and Apple. They've pulled back already from their highs. Microsoft, uh, going forward next couple of years, revenue expected to grow 12% annually, earnings 11%. So obviously very low double digits uh, for Microsoft. We take a look at uh, Al Alphabet. I always want to say Google. Google because the symbol is G-O-G-L, still the Google symbol. Take a look at this. A uh, little, little bit different of a chart. It, it's not this you know, straight from lower left to upper right. It, it was in a downtrend that was broken uh, in about March, April of this year. Started a new uptrend in the bottom in January. And it's continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. So this still looks good. That being said, if the other big seven pull back and the market pulls back, I see Google pulling back with it. And I think it could fill that gap, that earnings gap that it had uh, in July. That's around $124 a share. Just so happens the 50-day moving average is sitting there right now. So again, but that's only, what, a $6 pullback from here? So you're not looking at a lot. That's about a 4% pullback. So that's okay. Like, that's not bad when stocks are up like this. You pull back 4 or 5%. You could pull back 12%. It's okay. You realize most years when the S&P closes up double digits, we have a double digit pullback at some point, meaning we pull back at least 10% or more, and it still ends up double digits, up over 10%. It's just, it's just part of the market. Nothing goes straight up. So Google is expected to grow uh, its top line about 10% next couple of years annually, about 14% in earnings in the bottom line. Um, move over to Amazon. You know, Amazon to me, boy, boy, it's just, it's, I feel like it just keeps going. And it had amazing numbers, as you can see, are gapped up in early August on uh, on its earnings uh, to the best level uh, since uh, last August. So kind of near that high, not quite, not quite a 52-week high. But again, I think this pulls back and probably fills that gap at 130. It's at 138 right now. So again, folks, you know, what is that? About a 5% pullback or so, 6% um, pullback. That's okay. Again, if it does that, I would probably reevaluate it. I, again, I, I'm going to keep going back to this. I still think even if these all pull back and fill the gap and they look at great buys, I'm necessarily going to, not necessarily going to buy them. I'm not telling you to do that either. Nothing is a buyer sell recommendation. It's education. But what I'm saying is, even if that happens and the uptrend continues with the MAG 7, I still think the 493 will beat them in the next 12 to 24 months. 12 and 24 months, I should say, will beat the big guys. Because I just think that 
the smaller names we'll talk about at the end of the show are, are a bit undervalued compared to the big ones. So why not? I, I think there's a reversion to the mean there. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at NVIDIA, which, of course, has been the darling. Oh, real quick. Um, Amazon's expected to grow its top line about 10.5%. Earnings expected to grow about 31% annually the next couple of years. So really big growth on the, on the bottom line for that. NVIDIA, just to give you an idea, they're growing, uh, expected to grow top line revenue 25.5% annually, still going forward from here, even to $1 trillion company. And earnings over 31% bottom line annual. So here's a chart of NVIDIA. I mean, you just see I mean, in October, this was about $115 stock. We went to nearly 500 at 480 in July. We're down to 431 now. This one's tough because I, I love NVIDIA long term. It's got great growth. We're going to show you the valuation numbers after we go through these in a minute. Uh, I still love it long term. The, the problem is, could NVIDIA pull back and fill the gap at 300, 305? Sure. I think it does. Probably not. But could it? Yes. And that's you know $125 down from here. Could it never fill that gap again? Yes. And if you're waiting for that, you'll never be able to buy it. I think that NVIDIA, uh, by the end of this decade, is a $4 trillion company. And people think it's crazy at one. Again, I'm saying seven years. I'm not saying tomorrow or next day. I'm not saying it can't go down to $700 billion before it goes to $4 trillion. But I think it could be a $4 trillion company if it continues to execute because it's, it is the clear leader in GPUs and chips when it comes to artificial intelligence um, and the future of, of computing, uh, in, in my opinion. You also have quantum computing, which is the next AI, which we're going to start talking about more, but we're years away from that. Uh, I think NVIDIA is going to be a major player when it comes to quantum computing as well. And uh, when that happens, it, I think $4 trillion is not out of line uh, in seven years from now. Now let's take a look at, we have two more left, uh, the old Facebook, which is now Meta. Uh, Meta is expected to grow their earnings about 20% annually going forward and uh, about 11% uh, revenue annually uh, going forward. I mean, look at this chart. As I mentioned, uh, I, I just sold it in the last week and a half. So I, I got out and it doesn't mean I won't get back in, but this was a stock that I, I bought on a pullback. I didn't buy at the bottom, I'll tell you that. Uh, but I did take a little profit on it. And um, it's been rolling over after gapping up uh, and, and it's filling that gap around 300. It's got some more support around 290. You know, could it could it look good there? Sure, yeah, it could. Again, you know, the thing is with, with a lot of these these big seven we're looking at, they've pulled back from highs, but they're still in great uptrends. So until those uptrends are broken, it's tough to really become very negative on them. Uh, the last one we're going to take a look at uh, is Tesla, and with Tesla, their revenues expected to grow about nineteen percent annually, uh, earnings about twenty one and a half percent. Much different chart here. You know, most of them go are, are nice uptrends. Uh, Tesla's at the same level as it was uh, going back to uh, February of last year, uh, February of 2022. So it's been had some ups and downs along the way. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. He, I, I, I'll admit he's definitely odd. He's different. Um, he's unique, whatever you want to say about him. Uh, I am looking forward to him fighting Mark Zuckerberg, though. I think that's going to be pretty good. And I think they're going to raise a ton of money for charity. So that's a great thing. Uh, you know, Tesla here, again, like it's it's a stock that they people love and they hate. It could be 400 in the next year. It could be uh, down to 160. I don't know. But again, this is a company by 2030. Right now, it's uh, less than a trillion dollar, trillion dollar market cap. Uh, I think this is worth uh, at least two to three trillion dollars by the end of the decade, probably closer to three trillion uh, by the end of the decade. And again, people think I'm crazy. But you know what? About five, six years ago, uh, I was on stage several times, a couple years in a row with people that I will tell you are smarter than me, um, richer than me, maybe even better looking than me. And I was always backing Tesla back then. And um, I'll tell you this, uh, as I'm backing Tesla, there are several people up there saying Tesla was worth zero, zero. What is E-Crow for that? Now it's worth 700 billion. At one point it was worth a trillion. And again, I think it was up to 3 trillion by the end of the decade. So that's kind of where I stand on them, just, just technically and, and share some growth uh, here with you. But let's take a look at some valuations. That's important uh, as well. You know, I showed you the chart already of, of the performance. Now let's take a look at where the PE ratios are right now for the MAG7. Pretty damn high. <clears throat> you see here, NVIDIA is obviously a high. It's at 232, which is insane. You have Apple, or sorry, uh, Amazon at 110. Uh, the cheapest uh, is um, uh, Alphabet, Google, at 27.8. 
But that's right now the P.E. ratio of, of the last 12 months earnings and the price where it is. I don't care about what happened. Let's look forward, but take the forward estimates into it. Here are the forward P.E. ratios. Much different, huh? Suddenly, you know, uh, NVIDIA, which was at 200 and some, is now down to 40 because it's got such growth going forward with earnings in the next year, a forward one year P.E. ratio. The most expensive is Tesla, uh, Amazon up there. You have two below 20. You have Meta, which is Facebook, uh, below 20, uh, and Alphabet as well, uh, below 20. So again, does it mean they're cheap here? But w- what this shows you is there's a reason that they, they have such high valuations because they are growing and they are the leaders. Now, let's look at the price of sales because earnings one thing. Let's look at sales. Well, the other good thing is they're all earning money, as I told you earlier, different than a bubble. They're earning money. Here's your price of sales today. Uh, NVIDIA is in absolutely crazy 43, which is insane. Uh, on the bottom down there is Amazon at 2.6, which to me is pretty damn cheap for a company that truly dominates its niche market. Uh, some other expensive ones, Microsoft's actually very expensive, 11.5. But again, I don't care the last 12 months. Let's look at the next year for the sales estimates and see where price of sales come down to now. NVIDIA got caught in half, but still very expensive, 19.3. Microsoft fell to nine, but still very expensive there. Amazon, still cheap at 2.2. Alphabet's down there, Google at 4.8. We also have uh, Meta down there at 5.4. The big guy, Apple, comes in at 6.9. I remember you you used to be able to buy Apple several years ago uh, when it was trading at a a price of sales of of literally one to two. Um, And people didn't like it then. It's crazy. People didn't like it back then. Maybe they like it more and it's more expensive. Um, but I want to show you that only because that the numbers are high, the valuations are high. They, they have to come down a bit, 100%. The other thing is, you know, they, they can come down with sales and earnings going up and the stock going sideways because there's two, there's two parts to that equation. There's the price, which is the price per share. And then there's obviously for sales, it's sales revenue. And for earnings, it's how much the company is earning. So if the price comes down, obviously the PE ratio comes down. If the sales or earnings go up and the price is the same, the ratio also comes down. So you have to look at it that way. That, um, again, doesn't mean that these stocks get crushed. Doesn't mean you short these stocks. Doesn't mean you sell these stocks. None of that stuff. All I'm saying is that I think they do underperform the 493, let's call them, in the next 12 months and over the next 24 months. But again, I'm not saying sell this. If you own any mutual funds, there's likely of exposure to one, if not all of these and heavy exposure uh, to them at that. So what else could you do? And um, I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but uh, two ideas. One is to look for small and mid cap. Uh, I think small and mid cap are a really good way to go here. Um, I I think they are um, set to outperform for the next couple of years, uh, the mega cap names, uh, mag seven that we just talked about. So I I think that's, that's probably a great way to play it. The other way to play it is there's some funds out there that uh, take an equal weighting. So the s and is market cap weighted. So the bigger it is, the more you affect the movement of the um, uh, uh, index, which is why as it gets bigger, it's it, more weighting towards it, which is why you get these numbers that are inflated when 73% of the gain in the first six months came from the big seven. So it all makes sense if you really break it down. But there's another um, a way to look at this, and that's the um, equal weighted. So it takes all 500 stocks where it rebalances and 1% into each. So each one's worth the same. It will change over time. As some grow, they become more. And then, you know, obviously, uh, as some fail, they become less, less than 1%. It doesn't stay that way forever. They rebalance either every six months or once a year every quarter, depending on which fund you're looking at. I just happen to pull up one here. And this is uh, the Invesco S&P 500 equal weight ETF, symbol RSP. And as you can see here, uh, year to date, uh, it's lagging because it, that doesn't have big exposure to the MAG-7, only up 7.6% versus the S&P up 17%. Let's even zoom out to do a year, let's say. Still uh, lagging, not as bad. Let's look at five years. Still lagging a little bit because the big guys. Let's look at 10 years. Still lagging. But let's maybe look at the uh, last three months lagging. But now let's look at the last month. It's actually starting to, to outpace a little bit. And I think that that is the start of a new trend, folks. So if I were, if somebody asked me, again, there's no recommendations here to say, I want to invest in my first, for my first IRA at $1,000. 
I usually say, you know, go buy the S&P 500 first, build up a position that then you explore from there, core explore. I would say go into RSP. I think that's a better play here next couple of years versus S&P. I mean, is the S&P, but it's just equal weighted. So that and small and mid cap, I think you can't ignore that either. Uh, we had a guest on, um, or sorry, yeah, we had a guest on uh, uh, last week, Bev Favor, talking about international. But I'm saying you're just picking one to start. You only have a couple of bucks. I think RSP is a really good way to start out. All right, folks. So the Mag 7, they're here to stay. It is not a bubble, but I do think they underperformed the 493 in the next one to two years. So that's how we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments, questions, please put them below in the YouTube page. Please uh, like, share, let your friends know. And thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful evening. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.